Here's an example of a sequence which you say is convergent, but it's not monotonic. So um, that means we have to sort of justify why each of those claims is true, right? How do we know it's convergent? And then on the other hand, how do we know it's not monotonic? Um, let me pull up a, a visualization of that sequence. So here's that sequence, minus 1 to the n over n, at least the first 20-some terms of it. We could, we could go further out if we wanted to. Um, first of all, how do we know that this sequence is not monotonic? How could I prove that this sequence is not monotonic? Okay, right. So one of the ways that monotonic has these four different possibilities for it, right? Increasing, decreasing, non-decreasing, and non-increasing. Those are four different flavors of monotonic sequence. Um, I like to capture all of those by saying that monotonic means that it never changes direction. Right? Whatever direction the sequence begins going in, it never goes in the opposite direction. So if it increases at any point, then that means that it always has to increase. If it decreases at any point, then it always has to decrease. Um, or if it levels out, that's fine, right? It's fine as far as non-decreasing, non-increasing go. But we can't have it be increasing at one point and decreasing at some other point. So basically the derivative If we knew what the word derivative meant, we could say yes. In our course, we do not know what the word derivative means. Um, nor will we uh, for the rest of the semester. Uh, most first semester courses in real analysis come right up to where we might be able to define derivative, and then that's kind of where we leave things every <laughs> semester. But you're right. If we had a differentiable function that we were then trying to make a monotonicity claim about, we could use its derivative and the sign of its derivative to make that claim. Um, but for especially for a sequence where we don't know what the derivative of a sequence would be, we can come up with a discrete analog if we want to. Um, but yeah, that, that whatever, whatever notion we could use to quantify how the terms in the sequence vary from one point to the next, from one term to the next, that that character of that change has to be constant for a, uh, a monotone sequence. So this sequence is not monotone because, for example, what's the relationship between S1 and S2? S1's less than, S1's less than S2. What's the relationship between S2 and S3? S2 is greater than S3. Yeah, so right away we can see that the universal claim that's inherent in monotonicity, which is for all n, Sn is less than Sn plus 1, or Sn is greater than Sn plus 1, or whichever flavor of it we choose, that universal claim is going to be falsified by that observation right there. So even, even the presence of just these three first terms that go first up and then down, right, that alone right away guarantees this is not monotone. Um, OK, but then how do we know that this sequence is convergent? Minus 1 to the n over n is convergent. How do we know? <coughs> because for every epsilon that we can choose, there exists, so if I choose this as my epsilon, then there exists a capital N. Uh, and here, capital role of capital N is probably played by this term in the sequence, such that for all n greater than or equal to that capital N, we have that the nth term of the sequence. Uh, what's the limit of the sequence, by the way? Because in our definition of convergence, we need to say what the limit is. The limit is 0. Absolute value of Sn minus 0 is less than epsilon. And that's true then for all of these SNs that are inside this bandwidth, right? Um, so we could prove directly from the definition of convergence uh, that the sequence minus 1 to the n over n is convergent. So yeah, here's an example of a non-monotonic sequence which nevertheless is convergent. So there exists a sequence which is bounded but which is not convergent. And an example of such a sequence is just the alternating sequence of minus 1s to the n. Um, we looked at this example, so one of the first sequences that we ever analyzed uh, in our course. Right, we saw this, we met this sequence a long time ago, uh, and we decided that this sequence, the alternating sequence of minus ones to the n, are not convergent. Not only at the time, not only were we able to show that it's not convergent to zero, 
because we can find an epsilon such that the convergence criterion doesn't hold for that epsilon. In fact, any epsilon less than one will suffice uh, to show that there exists, there does not exist a capital N such that all of the terms past capital N in the sequence are within that epsilon distance of zero. Um, what was a little bit less obvious at the time, but which we might be able to prove now that we have a little bit more tools, is it was less obvious why we couldn't perhaps choose some other possible limit, right, some other value besides zero, um, to which maybe the sequence actually does converge. Right? Um, if we wanted to show the sequence does not converge to anything at all, we would somehow have to rule out all infinitely many possible values that the limit could take if we're going to directly use the definition of convergence. Um, so one of the real benefits to having additional characterizations of convergence as we're working on right now is it's going to give us the tools to do some stronger things that directly from the definition of convergence are actually pretty hard to do. If I wanted to show, for example, that this minus 1 to the n sequence not only doesn't converge to 0, but doesn't converge at all, one of the ways that I could do it is I could do it by passing to an alternative characterization of convergence. If convergence is equivalent to the Cauchy criterion, for example, then I could prove that this sequence doesn't converge at all by proving what? I can prove not convergent by proving, what was it, what did you say again? Yeah, I can prove that it's not convergent by proving that it's not Cauchy. Because the Cauchy criterion doesn't require us to specify the value of the limit, right? That's the real, that's what we really win by using the Cauchy criterion for a sequence, is we don't have to know up front, we don't have to say the limit of the sequence is capital L or whatever, and then go on to prove that. Um, the Cauchy criterion is limit agnostic. Right? It doesn't care what the sequence is converging to. It only guarantees for us, according to this equivalence, it only guarantees for us that the sequence does converge. And so maybe we could prove that this minus 1 to the n sequence is not Cauchy. Could we find an example of an epsilon such that the Cauchy criterion is not satisfied for that value of epsilon? In other words, such that there does not exist a capital N with a property that for all Ns past that capital N, all of the terms of the sequence are within epsilon of one another. What epsilon could we use to show that this sequence is not Cauchy? I need a, a radius for this bandwidth that is unable to contain the terms of the sequence regardless of where we place it. Yeah, anything less than one. Let's do 0.5 again, like we did before, right? So if I have a strip that has a radius of 0.5, then the claim is that regardless of where this strip is placed, it's not possible to trap an entire tail of the sequence within that strip. Um, so let's see if we can just quickly write up a proof of it. So Sn is not Cauchy. And to prove that it's not Cauchy, we have to turn around the statement, uh, the, the definition of Cauchy, right? So to be not Cauchy should mean that there exists an epsilon greater than zero, such that for all capital Ns that are natural numbers, there exists a little n which is greater than or equal to that n, such that the distance between the uh, sorry, there exists an n and an m. I'm on convergence autopilot here. We're actually working with Cauchy. Such that the distance between the nth term and the mth term is greater than or equal to our epsilon. And so you're saying, let's choose an epsilon for this sequence, uh, which is less than 1. So we'll choose, let's say conveniently, epsilon equals 0.5. So that what I have here is kind of a strip of, uh, of height equal to 1, um, but its radius is 0.5. So let's see if, for that, we can show that this is true. So let epsilon equal 0.5. Okay. That we can do because we're trying to establish an existence result. Right? And when we're trying to establish an existence result, it's OK for us to specifically say, let's bring epsilon into existence by specifying that it's equal to 0.5. But then the next part of our definition is we need to show something is true for all capital N's. And so that we have no control over. So let's let N be arbitrarily chosen. 
There's that magic phrase that indicates that the value of n cannot matter. And so I'm just going to pretend that my n is somewhere here. Let's say that my n is right here. Slide it over here so it looks like it's actually an integer value. Uh, so let's suppose that that is my capital N. So what I need to do now is I need to show that there exists a little n and a little m that are greater than or equal to my n, such that the nth term and the mth term of my sequence are not within 0.5 of one another. So how can I do that? How, how can I know that there exists a pair of terms here that are not within a distance of a half from each other? How should I choose my n and my m? Because again, we're trying to establish existence, so we do get to choose them if we want to. Any thoughts? I'm trying to show that my terms get far away from each other. Then the way to do that with this sequence, just sort of looking at what it looks like, is I need to make sure that I choose one of my terms such that the value of that term is negative 1, and the other of my terms such that the value of that term is positive 1. Because in that case, how far apart are those two values? How many units? They're two units apart. And 2 is greater than 0.5, and so that would establish our result, right? Um, OK, so now all I need to do is choose an n such that the nth term is, let's say, positive, and an m such that the mth term is negative. How do I know that I can always do that regardless of where my threshold, capital N, lives? How do I know that there's going to be a negative term and a positive term to the right of my capital N? Because there's infinitely many terms past my capital N. Not only that, how do I know that infinitely many of those terms are negative and infinitely many of them are positive? It's an alternating series, which means that whether or not the term is negative or positive depends on what property of my index. How does negative 1 to the n decide whether to be positive or negative? Yeah, right. When n is even, negative 1 to the n is positive 1. When n is odd, negative 1 to the n is negative 1. So all I need to do is choose my little n and my little m such that they have opposite parity, right? such that one of them is even and the other one is odd. And as long as I do that, then the absolute value of the difference is going to be equal to 2, which is greater than or equal to 0.5. So we can do this constructively. If I'm sort of unsure about why there exists a positive and a negative term to the right of my capital N, i.e., why there exists both an odd and an even number that are greater than n, what I could do is I could just define my little n to be, I don't know, let's say the next term after capital N, and then my little m to be the next term after that. We get a lot of latitude when we're doing an existence proof. We get to define that little n and that little m however we want to that suits our needs. So I'm just going to do it that way. And that will sidestep any sort of fussy arguments about infinitude or any of these other things we might want to, uh, to try to, to use. So that this is my n plus first term. This is my n plus second term. And I'm going to call the former n and the latter m. So let n equal n plus 1, m equal n plus 2. Then n and m have opposite parity, which is a result from number theory. One of them is even and one of them is odd, which implies that the absolute value of minus 1 to the n minus minus 1 to the m equals 2, and therefore is greater than epsilon, right, when epsilon is 0.5. So there is a proof that this sequence, the sequence of minus 1 to the n's, is not a Cauchy sequence. And if we believe the proof that Cauchy and convergence are equivalent for sequences of real numbers, if we believe that result, then this also implies that this sequence is not convergent to any real number. Regardless of where we set the bar, where we set our, our potential limit, we're not going to get this sequence to converge. And it's not convergent because it's not a Cauchy sequence. There's an example of a sequence which is monotonic but not convergent. And your example was just the sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on, and so on, and so on, right? 
So that would be Sn equals n. Right. It's monotonic but not convergent. And by the way, how is that even possible? What is this sequence not? It's not bounded. Because if it were monotonic and bounded, then it would have to be convergent. Um, that probably, to me, is one of the, so there, the two biggest results um, on this diagram here are the result in red that establishes the equivalence of convergence with Cauchy and what's called the monotone convergence theorem, which is the, the, the purple double arrow here, right, which shows us that any sequence which is both monotonic and bounded, if we can establish those two things, and those two things are generally pretty simple to establish for a sequence, those two things are sufficient for convergence which is great. It means we don't have to get into the epsilons and the n's and all that nasty business. All we have to do is establish monotonicity and boundedness. Um, what we're going to see um, in a little bit, and maybe we'll do this example next, um, is that if we can understand that that is true of a sequence, and if we can prove that that's true of a sequence, um, then that will be enough to guarantee convergence without having to do a lot of fussy stuff.